together and investigate whatever is your passion to investigate. That's the golden opportunity we talked about. Already this afternoon we started to go into war a little bit and, and the insanity of all that, how extreme that seems, start to work that in and we talked about, you know, there was a suggestion maybe of going into the special relationship and taking a look at that. What we're really looking at is we're looking at the ego thought system. And the main point we have to keep coming back to is it has to be thoroughly looked at, thoroughly investigated, because if you raise part of it to light and keep part of it in darkness, then you might as well be all the way in the dark, because that's the way it is. You have to either raise this this thing all the way up, or you, you sleepwalk. You kind of stay asleep. And one of the things about, we talked a little bit about this special love relationship or special relationships is, is that Jesus says that we've looked at a lot of the other aspects of the ego very closely, but until this one is raised to light, you won't let the ego go. As long as you have an investment in, in anything of the ego system, then you have an investment in the whole system. So it can even seem like, well, I'm making good progress now. I'm I'm judging less, I'm less prejudiced, or I'm more this, I'm more that, and, and in the end, it comes down to, unless you raise it all the way up, then it's kind of the illusion of progress. And in many ashrams and many spiritualities throughout the ages, even when people have attained psychic powers and abilities, and attained what the world size would seem to be quite advanced states of consciousness, it's still, as long as there's ego tricks, then it's not the release that the mystics have talked about. So, is there anything that's coming up that is your passion, that is your burning question to go into very deeply tonight? We have to transform the special relationships into holy relationships. Well, as transform is a good word, and, and we were discussing translate or retranslate it, and getting away from the idea that, okay, here's special relationships, and I have to give up something. But if you think about it as, well, okay, everyone who seems to be in this world has formed special relationships. There's nobody who's come here who doesn't have any, but really it's, it's how can I transform my perception? of what relationships are. Because initially, it's difficult to even conceive of or imagine a relationship without talking about bodies. And even when people discuss, we have a long, long distance relationship, or a coast to coast relationship. <laughs> what was it years ago? It was um, Bill Donahue and Marlo Thomas. Thomas. She was in Chicago, and she was in whatever, New York. But, but that's just another example of relationships being in terms of bodies, because if it's described as where those bodies are, the difficulty of having a long-distance relationship, seemingly, as opposed to you know both being under the same roof and so on and so forth, and that's kind of the starting point of all special relationships involve bodies. Holy relationships are symbolic as well of just the mind giving up all judgment and all thought of what relationships mean in, in the ego sense. And it's just a metaphor for a healed perception. It's just another way of talking about healed perception. And then there's a section in the Course where Jesus talks about the only real relationship, which is kind of, well, what's he mean by the only real relationship? And he says that the only real relationship is the relationship between the Father and the Son. So that has nothing at all <laughs> to do with special relationships or holy relationships. But holy relationships, again, being healed perception, that's the step that the mind has to take. That's the direction it has to move so that it can remember the only real relationship. Isn't it also a reflection of that real relationship? Yeah. So it's not the thing itself, it's symbolic or representative of the only real relationship. 
also, what was coming to mind is two sections in the course. One really goes into specialness and how it has to be looked at, and then the following section in the course is part of this translation that you were saying, you're wanting to get to a translation or a transformation, and it described in great detail what that um, transformation is like. It talks about stages of disorientation, and it's kind of nice that even here has a roadmap and hear Jesus talking about this period because it's kind of like there can be the there can be the thought, well, I, I'm somewhat clear now, and as I get clearer and clearer and clearer, I'll just get clearer and clearer until I have a burst of clarity and wake up. And actually, he's saying, you know, you're not clear at all now, and as you go along and along, you'll, and you'll seem to get clearer and clearer and clearer, and the clearer you get, you reach a point of disorientation. <laughs> yeah. You got it, Jesus. And it's nice to have it described in there because yes. if you don't have an yes. idea of it, it can seem like the ego can kick in like you're doing it all wrong or you're doing something terribly wrong. But how can following the Holy Spirit come to a place of aimlessness or, or disorientation? And yes. he's describing it as you become accustomed to a world of total darkness where nothing means anything. And now, as you turn your... It's basically saying that as long as you believe that you're in a world of separation and fragmentation, that your whole perception is backwards and upside down. So if you can imagine turning something forwards and right side up, it's kind of like a... Uh, Vertigo. Yeah. <laughs> right. Or those, those little things when you shake them yeah. in the snow for Christmas, right. you know, and when the snow settles, it's great. Then when you start to turn it around, it gets real murky and the snowflakes are all over and it takes a while before all the snowflakes settle on the, the top, so to speak. And that's a good, another little metaphor for what, what's happening with, with this transformation of mind. It also, for me, it was helpful to see that it was like reading that, it was like just having a feeling that Jesus, Holy Spirit, whatever, for me it felt like Jesus really understands what I'm going through. He's describing it in great detail. Mm -hmm. And that was so reassuring to me. It was like he had his arm around me and said, it's okay. A little farther. I know <laughs> what you're going through. I know it's not fun. I know it doesn't feel good, but it's okay. Hang in there. Yeah, and that was like the little bit that I needed to hang in there. Because otherwise it felt like Turn and run. <laughs> the heal the relationship. So, if everyone's game, we just turn to the choice for completion, which is on page 317 of the first edition. What is that? 317 of the first edition. 241. 317 in the first edition and 341 in the second edition. What's the title of the section? The Choice for Completion. And the section which follows it is called The Bridge to the Real World, where we talk about this transition period mm -hmm. of disorientation. So we'll work our way. We'll start off with the choice for completion to just get kind of a snapshot or a pretty good look at the... Uh, I thought you were talking about the That describes so. things as well. Yeah. So, 317. Mm -hmm. Choice for completion. In looking at the special relationship, it is necessary first to realize that it involves a great amount of pain. Anxiety, despair, guilt, and attack all enter into it, broken into by periods in which they seem to be gone. All these must be understood for what they are. Whatever form they take, they are always an attack on the self to make the other guilty. I have spoken of this before, but there are some aspects of what is really being attempted that have not been touched upon. So generally, when we talk about special relationships, another term that we could use would be love-hate relationships. And every relationship that one seems to have in this world would easily fall into the category of love-hate. Whether it's with your your spouse, your parent, your 
son or daughter, your pet, <laughs> your employer, you know, nobody in this world seems to have a perfect relationship where there is always total bliss, peace and happiness. There always seems to be that, well, as he describes, pain, ang anxiety, despair, guilt, attack, all enter into it. But there seems to be some pretty good periods where it seems like you're cruising along pretty good. It seems like everything's working real well. But then the hate rears its head. Sometimes it's not a real overt. Sometimes it's just minor annoy annoyances, little bitty irritations, frustrations. Again, Jesus says there's no difference between rage, hatred, and minor annoyances. So it still all falls in that category of love-hate. Very simply, the attempt to make guilty is always directed against God. For the ego would have you see him, and him alone, as guilty, leaving the sonship open to attack and unprotected from it. So this is the basic ego belief that God is angry, and that God has pretty much abandoned you in this world, and you've abandoned God, and this is a kingdom that's been made up apart from God, and that... Uh, the special relationship attempts to find some kind of pleasure in the dust, so to speak, or find something that's consoling or seems to have the characteristics of love or seems to be act as a substitute for love, is really an attack it's, it's directed against God. I don't understand how that happens. Well, we could talk a little bit about the dynamics in the sense that we've used on a couple different occasions, we used this scenario one time where we said that in the beginning we're all as one, and there crept a tiny mad idea, which the Son of God remembered not to laugh. We've also looked at the section where it talks about, you made just one substitution, you know, delusion for truth, and it's been a fragmenting substitution. And you, you, the whole world that you see is a world of fragmentation that just sprang from that one thing. So the mind wants to believe that it's separated from God, it believed it was it was horrified at what it thought it had done. And in its horror, it was advised by the pup or the snake or the tempter to become identified with a screen in which the air was projected, a world of form. And that's where all the special relationships that we're going to be talking about come in. In other words, all those relationships with bodies, whether they be bodies, husbands, wives, children, pets, whatever, it's, it's still relationships are seen to be between bodies, and as long as those are held on to, it's still not going within the mind and questioning the whole belief system that this whole world is built on. And in that sense, it's, it's being distracted by these relationships and bodies, and the, the guilt that's been buried and the fear that we were talking about earlier this afternoon is not being questioned and looked at. So, in a sense, by using the screen, using the world as the smoke screen to hide from God, it's, it's generally, it's seen as attacking God. Not in reality. In other words, in reality, the Holy Spirit's back there, the light in the mind is saying, you can't attack God. You know, it's be, he's beyond attack. <laughs> and in reality, you can't attack yourself. You, you can deceive yourself and the Holy Spirit keeps reminding the mind, you know, come back to me, come back to me. We have to question all these false beliefs because attack isn't real. Another way we could say it is that the attack against God is really the mind's belief that it can and has attacked. And one of the basic cornerstones of the Course is that the mind cannot attack. The mind is really one, and how, how can something that's one attack? It doesn't have anything to attack with, or to be attacked. <laughs> it's just this abstract mind. But, he says, you can make up fantasies, and you can make bodies up, and bodies can seem to attack each other. And as long as the mind believes in those fantasies, that those fantasies are reality, then it certainly seems like attack is real. And if the mind believes that it